That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Invisible Beauty. <laughs> a documentary co-directed by Beth Ann Hardison and Frederick Cheng. It's the fourth uh, documentary from uh, Frederick Cheng that premiered at the 2023 Sundance Film Festival is being released courtesy of Magnolia Pictures and a limited theatrical run on September 15th, 2023 before it expands to later cities afterwards. Do I know any of Frederick's other works? Uh, no, but they're all fashion related. Oh. Uh, his documentary debut was about Diana Vreeland, The Eye Has to Travel, which he co-directed with two other directors. Uh, he also did Dior and I in 2014 and Halston in 2019. He also serves as the editor uh, on all those documentaries and um, cinematographer sometimes. Well, this documentary is about fashion revolutionary Beth Ann Hardison as she looks back on her journey as a pioneering black model, modeling agent, and activist, shining a light on an untold chapter in the fight for racial diversity. What's your pull quote? An interesting but broad trajectory of pervasively racist traditions in the fashion industry somehow allows the pioneering personality it portends to be about to remain an obscure, impenetrable subject herself. My pull quote, Invisible Beauty is a compelling documentary about a woman's life's work, which oftentimes feels more like an obituary. Uh, yeah, so Beth Ann, I mean, the, the premise tells it all. So she started off as a, a model and then moved on to becoming an, a, a modeling agent. Like she had her own agency and then she transitioned into fighting for more inclusion of black models in fashion. And then there are chapters in her life pertaining to that. But like you mentioned, impenetrable. She she even says, like, we hear people say they don't really know her. There's a moment when she says she doesn't really have anyone who she can... Um, who's a friend or a mentor to her. Because she's a mentor to... Every, she's kind of like a surrogate mother to all of these very notable people who are often getting teary in their confessionals about her, which I find interesting because... Conversely, some of them do admit they don't know her. Like, right. So that's why I say it's an obituary because, assuming because she's co directing it, like she's really crafting this image about herself and her work, which is fair. But I almost felt like her work is maybe more interesting as it's presented here than she is as an individual. Mm -hmm. So whenever we get her sort of on her own sort of living life. It's all, she, it appears she has like three homes, like an apartment in New York City, a nice house in upstate New York, and then a home in Mexico. And anytime we see her just at home, she's just sitting there, like meditating, looking off into the sky. She doesn't socialize. We, we really don't see her living beyond working and talking about work. Mm -hmm. So um, that that's my overall thought, that maybe I we should have just focused on her coalition, to promote diversity in fashion. Because like you mentioned, there are so many um, like interesting major people in this documentary. There's Tracy Ellis Ross, Zendaya, Whoopi Goldberg, Tyson Beckford, Bruce Weber, Pat Cleveland, Iman, Fran Lebowitz, Veronica Webb, Naomi Campbell. We even have Ralph Lauren in there talking about how he made Tyson Beckford his, like the face of his uh, line for years. Yeah, because Beth Ann was the conduit. Because she was his agent and she pushed for it. So, And, and it's utilizing a still of her that's, I think, at, very beautiful. And I think it's a Bruce Weber still of Beth Ann Hardison with the tree. Oh, yes. <laughs> and then within this documentary, we also see, I don't think this was crafted very well, but sort of like her also trying to write her memoir. It feels very tangential and random, especially when combined with her assistant, <laughs> who's incognito. Like, definitely, like, when we, when we first meet this person, they're wearing a mask, sunglasses, and a beanie, and speaking very quietly. Inside the house. Inside the house. It's it, it's strange. It's almost like the memoir is like something that, I don't know, I didn't research, is it out now? Or is it just something that she's doing for the documentary? I don't know. It made me think that I hope that there's more personality in the memoir, at least that we're not able to see here. But again, there's nothing wrong, and especially it makes sense to me that somebody just co-directed this documentary about themselves that is curated in a way that we, we are 
we are only focusing on certain subjects. And, the, and again, that's fine. It just doesn't make for the most interesting, compelling thing. And after watching it, I wasn't led to want to read the memoir right. as I was with watching the documentary about Polly Murray. Right. Or like Andre Leon Talley. Or, mm -hmm. I mean, there are so many other people who, yeah, getting to know them in the brief documentary would lead me to want to learn more. And with her, because she's so guarded, because beyond her own career, she's notable because her son is quite famous. Her son is Kadeem Hardison. Who I was, before watching this, I, that's who I was more familiar with. Yeah. And for people who don't know, he was on a popular sitcom called A Different World. But... In, in some movies, he's in like a, a vampire in Brooklyn and... Death by Temptation. Yeah. Uh, he had, I think he, his debut might have been rapping. But... Mario Van Peebles. She is very guarded about like her romantic life. Her parenting is kind of in question because we do get Kadeem in the documentary talking. It's very... Uh, it's confusing because he talks about how grateful he is to his mother for everything she did for him, but also... She like he's he has so much anxiety around being around his mother that he doesn't see her for long periods of time. And the way Beth Ann handles it is just like, well, he's going through something. I don't know. And then we also see her mentoring. She's also like a she's kind of like a surrogate mother to these other young people, which feels odd considering that in the same documentary, we see that her own son kind of can't really be around her and she doesn't address it really yes like as compared to like Iman or naomi campbell who have a kind of seemingly have a very emotional investment in, yeah. in beth ann as compared to her son who's like you don't talk to your my mother unless you're prepared to hear the real real truth uh because she doesn't varnish her words and we get the sense that maybe he gets anxious around her because he's not his career hasn't like maybe it's stalled and she pressures him into like, well, keep going, do more things and he doesn't want to. But we don't really get into that, which I find very interesting that, like, again, I think the documentary really should focus more on her work then. Well, it's saying a lot in what it doesn't say. Yeah. I think the most interesting moment, if we're talking about the mother-son relationship, is um, the video footage that uh, when he bought her a car uh, after he got his first major paycheck from a different world. And yeah, and he buys her a very expensive, like, a Range Rover. And you're going to comment about the abortions? No, you can. Oh, <laughs> well, she's... Well, first we see... Because, you know, she's selecting the footage they're choosing. So she also selects... Because she's asked, like, are you proud of your son? And she goes, well, it's hard for me to say I'm proud of him. Because even Kadeem says, like, she doesn't really ever say she's proud of me. And she goes, well, because I don't want him to think that... He's perfect and that there's always more he can do. And then she's on like a talk show and she's saying that... There's this white lady um, that's looking at her while she's talking. <laughs> that was really funny because even that white lady's looking at her like, damn, you can't even just say you're proud of your famous son. <laughs> right. And then we cut to her uh, receiving like some lovely flowers and then he goes, I bought you this car, this very expensive Range Rover. And then she says something to the effect of like, you know, out of all the abortions I had, I'm glad I kept you. And I know that's, I mean, it's a very dark joke, but in the context of how she appears as a mother, it's all just very strange to me that it, I think, yeah, I'm hoping her memoir explains it, more. It suggests there is a side to her personality that I, I would be keenly interested in seeing that, that's probably flinty and steely and kind of maybe off-putting, but also um, uh, human in a way that at least I would find very compelling. She doesn't, yeah, it's... Anyway, going through my notes, so she talks about her upbringing and how her father was a member of the Nation of Islam. He was super strict with her and uh, at a point, because she wanted to be more of a free spirit, he said, well, then you need to go back to your mom then because I'm not raising a daughter like you. But well, she I think her grandma. Or grandmother. Yeah. But then she talks about how like in school, because she was a little more... She, she got to do more things. The other black students would say that she's trying to be or act white and she had a funny line saying that that's ridiculous because every morning when i brush my teeth i see a black girl in the mirror but then she goes if you're going to go to the circus get on the rides like so that's why she's doing all these things that that are stereotypically considered to be for white people but they were available to her and she was doing them um in and in, in uh in the south where uh segregation was just uh 
where, where desegregation was just starting. So she's kind of one of the, she's the first black cheerleader at her school. Yeah, and then she's part of the, like, like, like you know, busing black students to white schools. And her attitude about it is very positive. So mm -hmm. I thought that was interesting. Then we get a segment about her modeling career, which doesn't seem that significant. Uh, and then she talks about her, like, modeling style. And actually looking at her modeling kind of felt like, <laughs> I don't know. She definitely didn't seem in the same category as other models she's pictured with. Sure. Mm -hmm. So I, I found that interesting. I don't think she herself is trying to like amplify her modeling career certainly her work owning a modeling agency is much more prolific mm -hmm. but i thought that was like hearing her talk about how she mimicked her walk after a samurai and oh yeah it was a little silly i think we're me. watching uh, kurosawa's seven samurai in there then we get to so what i really think would have been a better documentary is this black girls coalition where she has all of these like notable black models and we get her doing that in the 90s and then also in the like late knots mm -hmm. and particularly in like 2007 she has this two-day like panel where she talks about it. and we get footage from it and there are heated moments there's some really i um, interesting people part of the discussion i feel like there could have been an entire documentary about that two-day forum mm -hmm. Then we move forward to 2013 and we see that there was another, and I remember this. I do too, yeah. Where she was, was doing sort of the media rounds with Naomi Campbell and Iman because she had started this list every year collecting data of all the different fashion shows and fashion, fashion houses and literally counting how many models they use and how many of those models are black. So then calling out these designers. I mean, it's just like, I wrote down, drag them. That's the only way you can make people accountable is you have to, you have to literally drag them. I think there could be a documentary about that movement. And then the past 10 years, we really don't get much. It seems like she's kind of just been like settling into her golden years and I guess working on this memoir. Yeah, I mean, again, I think that the individual doesn't have a or isn't willing to give us enough to make it interesting, which so, is, which is fine. Which yeah, she can be private, but then again, it's like let's see more about your work then, I guess, um, because we don't we don't. She talks about not having much of a romantic life or friends, but then she says she has lovers, and then I'm still unclear if we met Kadim's dad in the documentary. There was a gentleman, Donald McFadden. And then I think we see his picture, but mm -hmm. she definitely doesn't talk about that at any length. Well, it's funny what she does give us about the one little blurb about lovers and people, people, the two that she said that she thought got away and here in, in retrospect saying that, well, you never seemed like you were really interested because she was so guarded. She never let them know how she really felt. Something she them. said that I always think is interesting when people ask, because people often ask me about relationships and it's like, well, it's very personal. Like, like it's the individual needs to customize their needs and hearing her talk about relationships she made sort of like a blanket statement about like how every relationship runs its course and i she seems like the kind of person who is cold and wants to be autonomous and can't reconcile that with having certain needs mm -hmm. which i can relate to like not having friends well i'm kind of difficult and want to be things my own way so it's hard to you know interact with other people sometimes but I, I think it's funny that as smart as she is and as accomplished as she is, the the areas where she's lacking, it's like she doesn't want to shine a light on that, mm -hmm. which is fair. I mean, it's her documentary that yeah. she's in control of. It's fair, but also maybe limiting and, you know, if you're co-directing your own kind of documentary about yourself. But uh, something that, and, and you know, when she shuttered her own modeling agency in 96 and goes off to Mexico and then has to come back because we... Uh, I, I guess I didn't realize that part of the fashion trend, at least indicated in this documentary, was that the the collapse of the Berlin Wall and the sudden access to all this uh, creative talent, like these Eastern European looking women, was part of the reason why we started getting all in the late that, 90s that influx. The, yeah. uh, um, but of I, all the models looking very similar, super thin, white, blonde, you know. Robotic, uh, malnourished. But... Uh, but I find it interesting how even something that she really loved doing, she wanted to retreat into herself and felt the need. She was compelled to come forward and do that again uh, and, and to speak to the diversity that is needed in this industry. But the one line that she had that resonated with me and I think holds true, should hold true for everyone is, you know, activism has to remain active. There, there will be immediate backsliding. <laughs> yeah, that was actually a really... 
I, I thought profound statement from her in, in, in relation to her career as well. Like when she sort of thought her work was done and she had seen more inclusion, when she backed off, things kind of reset back to what it was. So she had to come back and then she had to come back again. And then now the end of the documentary is talking about sort of how she feels hopeful in sort of the Black Lives Matters uh, movement and like all these young people being motivated that she, because then she she's questioning or talking about her mortality and saying that, you know, the questions being brought up, like who's gonna take over when you die? And she's saying, well, all these beautiful young people who are motivated and active. So it does end on a hopeful note. I've kind of felt sad for her because she seems kind of like lonely and yeah, like there does. She never seems joyous, even in photos. It's like she's smiling, but there doesn't seem to be a lot of joy behind the it. The only joyful scene is that moment with the car because she seems taken by surprise. Yeah, like like she seems she she reminds me of a little bit like Jane Fonda is in. I've thought about everything I'm going to say ahead of time, even the funny things I say, and uh, everything seems very mannered uh, in a way that you don't... And, it, and it's hard to see authentic surprise in someone because they're always thinking... Prepared. They're, they're always prepared and several steps ahead of everybody else, and it, to me that is very apparent with her. But still a remarkable individual who's done a lot for an industry, so I think if anyone is concerned about inclusion, civil rights, fashion, they would certainly be interested in this documentary. Right, and also a testament of like why we, because Whoopi Goldberg says without her, we'd probably be 25 years behind, at Where least we are today. We're in this yeah. industry as far as diversity and representation. But it's like, when there's one person doing it, it, it why, where are the where's the support? Where are the other people? It's kind of like how I felt about Ruth Bader Ginsburg has to be on her deathbed. <laughs> Well, we take for granted, <laughs> We right? take for granted. It's like if you're like, always doing the dishes, and then why would I do them? If You know, like, I mean... Right, but it's a reminder that we all need to be yeah. a part of that uh, solution. We can't just put it all on one person's shoulders. No. So, I mean, in, in that regard, I think this documentary is effective. Yeah. Uh, what would you give it? Three. I would give it three out of five. Hit the thanks button. Listen to our podcast. Bye. Bye. Oh, 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 oh,